X-Men is relevant again! But I already reviewed the old show. You should check that out, Wolverine was there. I don't want to do the other two shows yet. Not until I can ask Scott McNeil an important question. So where's that leave us? Well, after talking about Roger Corman's Fantastic Four, I'm in the mood for the obscure and forgotten annals of comic book history. Haha, <laughs> annals. So in the spirit of childish humor, let's look back at Generation X. Not the group of 50-year-old pot-smoking Star Wars fans that raised us, I mean the made-for-TV movie that was meant to pilot a new live-action X-Men TV series to ride the hype of the comics breaking sales records, and the cartoon redefining what kind of storytelling a Saturday morning action figure show could give us. X-Men was everywhere in the 90s. It was so prevalent that the two nerds who sired me named me after the leader of the team. Though Godzilla also came up during the conversation, and I keep his name on the channel as a constant reminder of the life I could have had. But X-Men's massive popularity at the time wasn't enough to afford this strange little attempt at a TV show a big enough budget to tell the story properly. Come with me to a lesser known piece of comic book television history to learn why Generation X was a big depressing disappointment that never accomplished anything. And also why the TV show didn't work out. Heyo! Joining me today for this dive into the grungy world of the 90s is my friend Diego Rivera, who remembers slightly more of the 90s than I do, but not by much. Hey guys, you've probably seen me here a couple times already. It's not the first time me and Xavier have covered an X-Men related thing, and it certainly won't be the last. Anyway, I have an unfathomable fascination for weird, forgotten, and obscure superhero projects. So when Xavier asked me if I wanted to help cover the Generation X TV pilot, I said, what the hell is that? And well, that's all the incentive I needed. So much like every X-Men adaptation ever, forever, it'll never end, it opens with a young mutant girl that's been recruited by the team to serve as a vehicle for the audience to learn about the already established X-Men. Kitty Pride Jubilee, Allison Crestmeyer, Rogue, Hisaki Ichiki, Kitty Pride a second time, this time Jubilee is white though! Very weird casting choice. Not a fan personally. Like, yeah, the character's last name could still be Lee if they're white, but even Stan's last name was actually Lieber. I'm just so used to Jubilee being Chinese that this throws me off and I forget it's even supposed to be the same character. Like, I look at that and that just doesn't, like, that's not Jubilee. Much like X-Men the Animated Series, a little bit of her first appearance in the comics was adapted here with her getting into trouble with the anti-mutant law enforcement. Though the animated version was way closer to the book. The entire rest of this isn't going to have much else to do with comics, so there's not much else to compare beyond that. When I talk about adaptations being made by people in Hollywood who don't care or maybe even actively dislike the source material, this is something that more readily comes to mind. Basically, no major X-Men characters show up in here. If they do, they're like wrong. And the very basic concepts of X-Men are also haphazard in execution. Second main character is a boy named Angelo who has easily one of the worst superpowers ever. Like, you know what people jokingly talk about what would be a terrible superpower? Like the ability to only fly north or invisibility that only works when no other people can see you? His skin and muscle stretch, but not his bones apparently? They always say it's only his skin. Even his X-Men codename is Skin, and it seems like using his powers is actually agonizingly painful because every time they show it, he's screaming bloody murder. I gotta give them props for doing a decent stretchy human effect so close after Corman's Fantastic Four, and it being a little bit better in this one, though the CGI shot at the end doesn't look the best. If there's anything this show does well, it's that it reminds me of how good we had it with the other X-Men TV series from this time period. X-Men the Animated Series was a godsend, and I'm so glad it's back and better than ever. Which reminds me, wanna interact with the X-Men themselves? Special thanks to Whatnot for sponsoring this video. Whatnot is an amazing app for buying and selling merchandise with a personal touch to connect sellers with their audience during live interactive auctions. And this month, from April 11th to 14th, Whatnot is holding the world's largest virtual convention exclusively on the Whatnot app. You can get items signed by your favorite celebrities and creators without the hassle of standing in never-ending lines. There will be over 1,400 exhibitors, including sellers, artists, celebrities, and studios like Marvel and more. Even shows on Friday, April 12th with the cast of X-Men 97, so you can come hang out with Lenore Zahn, Allison Seeley Smith, Tony Daniel, 
and Catherine Disher, which will be hosted by Unknown Comics Live starting at 5.30 to 6.30 Eastern Time and 7 to 8 Eastern Time. To set your reminder for the stream, log into Whatnot and search for Unknown Comics Live and select the Reminder option so you won't forget to check it out. Be sure to use my link in the description to get started with Whatnot today. Be sure to download the Whatnot app and set your reminder so you don't miss this massive event. Now back to the video. It seems that the crew was very cost conscious when it came to picking characters whose powers have to be depicted with visual effects. Jubilee's powers are ones you can't really get around using at least some level of computer graphics, unless you're really crafty with pyrotechnics, so she only uses them like twice? And apart from Angelo's big Reed Richards moment at the end of the pilot, the only other heavy VFX moments are when Cy I mean Kurt, uses his optic bl I mean thermodynamic emissions from his eyes. Which again, he only uses twice. Otherwise, he mainly uses his other mutant power, X-ray vision, which is always just verbally implied. This other guy's power is to harden his skin to match whatever he touches. It doesn't have a visual effect on his skin, so it's depicted by using practical effects like breaking styrofoam logs on his head or a character hurting their hand when they punch him. Arlie Hicks, aka Buff, has a physical mutation that makes her <laughs> jacked. She wears loose fitting clothing throughout the entire movie because she's immensely insecure about her musculature and the only time we get a look at her physique is when she's trying out an outfit in a fitting room. They do this hilarious cut to a body double that's definitely not a male bodybuilder in a wig. But hey, I guess it works. Better than trying an ambitious CGI monstrosity that would have aged terribly or an awkward muscle suit. But girl, you got nothing to be ashamed about. Over here, we love a muscle mommy, and anyone who doesn't is a coward. This last student, Monet St. Croix, or simply M, her immune power is that she's better than you at everything. I'll, I'll just let her rattle off her powers. Wait a second, what was your special gift? Speed reading and humility? And there's the experts can tell, I'm perfect. I have advanced brain functions, high density skeletal mass, superior tissue and endocrinology. I'm immune to all known viral and bacterial entities. I have level eight invincibility, including high dynamic thermal repulsion. Yeah, well, you're sure repulsing me. So, yeah. Isn't that Shatterstar's power? I'm basically better than you at everything. So the plot is that Emma Frost once shut down this unethical scientist named Tresh by ruining his experiment. He's building a device to go into people's dreams and implant suggestions that'll change their behavior when they're awake. Oh dear God, he invented Inception. It's just Inception. Tresh wants to get revenge on Emma by finishing his dream machine and using it to steal power from mutant students at Xavier's school. Uh, already this show has some very basic things about X-Men wrong. For example, they treat it like every mutant ever is kind of psychic on some level, which makes them all uniquely able to go into this dream dimension without the aid of a machine. The students at Xavier's school are also all taught how to use Cerebro, so any of them can access it, apparently. And the school itself is very weird. It's cool that they actually filmed this at the same castle that would be used for the majority of the other live-action X-Men movies, so it very much feels like Xavier's school, but it's missing an important aspect. My damn namesake! Professor X isn't here. They never even talk about him. For some reason, the school is only run by Banshee and Emma Frost and no one else at all. There's no other teachers or staff. There's only like six students total and two of them join the school in this episode. They didn't have the budget to have any extras roaming around the halls? It's so empty. The whimsical school for superpower kids vibe is all wrong when it's just a giant empty building with only two adults and they apparently force all the students to strip naked for some kind of invasive biometric scan to join. This doesn't feel like a safe place. This is scary as f I don't wanna go to this school. Why'd they add that for? For more sexual tension? With the 15 year olds? It was the 90s, that's what television was about! I guess the biggest surprise for me was that despite this being a pilot intended for network television is weirdly how adult this comes across in all the strangest ways. When I heard obscure pilot for a 90s X-Men TV show, my brain conjured up some silly ass TMNT next mutation thing you'd put on Fox Kids because of the success of the animated show. Where here they are throwing slurs at each other and White Jubilee is dropping multiple F-bombs. I think that's, that was the scariest thing I have ever felt in my entire life. 
I cosmically shit my pants. <laughs> that and the language is really vulgar in general. Edgy and extreme were the keywords for the 90s, I guess, but just a little unexpected. At the very least, the cast has a few notable people that I think are cool voice actors. Russell Tresh is played by Matt Frewer, who also played the leader in the Hulk series around the same time. He sometimes slips back into doing that voice, since he's yet another evil mad scientist character in here, and you gotta love him hamming it up in every scene. Guys, I'm feeling seriously omnipotent! Frewer absolutely steals the show. Admittedly, he comes off as if he's doing an exceptional Jim Carrey impression, especially when compared to the Riddler in Batman Forever, which had just come out a year prior and features Carrey as an eccentric mad scientist type, pushing a machine to the big wigs at Wayne Enterprises that also has the capabilities to probe people's minds and hey wait a minute! This Tresh character being the main antagonist is pretty refreshing because he's just unabashedly a villain. Nowadays, the go-to strategy for villains in comic book movies is to make them sympathetic or give them motivations that make the audience go, huh, you, you know what, they actually make a good point. Which is certainly effective for making a compelling bad guy. Tresh is just a Saturday morning cartoon villain brought into live action. He may not have the most intricate motivations, but the way Frewer chews up scenes makes up for that. He's so animated and completely unhinged at times. You've been circumcised. Actually, with his powers, could he just stretch it back? Can it even be cut in the first place? You know what? That's not important. I think you ought to get him some help. He seems to be really hung up on superhero sex organs. I also found Jeremy Ratchford as Banshee really likable. He's funny, charismatic, and wears a dashing vest. <laughs> He's like that cool uncle that tries to take the heat off you and lets you get away with stuff you definitely shouldn't be getting away with, which makes for the perfect foil against Emma Frost's more hard-ass, no-nonsense attitude. And he also voiced Banshee in the animated series. That's awesome! One of the other students named Mondo is played by Bumper Robinson, who you may know for his voice work as characters like Bumblebee, Rook from Ben 10, The Falcon in a bunch of Marvel projects, or Deadshot in the new Suicide Squad game. Thank God he got to go on to be in more interesting comic adaptations than this one. And of course, good old Gary Chalk is here. Hit it, Prime! Subscribe to Xavier for more videos like this one. Outside of those examples, no one else in the cast stands out to me as being exceptional. They're all just trying their best with the script that's so melodramatic, but also pretty dull. Despite being almost feature length, I couldn't really tell you much about any of the characters outside of one personality trait each. Everyone's kind of a different teenager stereotype. That's the mean girl, that's the nerdy guy, that's the slacker, that's the jock, and so on. Even Skin and Jubilee aren't especially memorable themselves, and weirdly, the characters are so mean and combative with each other all the time. I'm sitting here trying to remember some of the fun ways this pilot has the students explore and learn about their mutations, and nothing comes to mind except scenes of Angelo sitting in a dimly lit room in front of a computer terminal, or staring at a magic eye poster trying to decipher what it's showing. Oh, a sailboat. The late 90s were all about computer hacking, cyberspace, and general technological advancements, so it was trendy to feature scenes like this in movies, but this is just so boring for the X-Men. Some of my favorite moments from superhero movies are those early scenes of our heroes trying to figure out their powers or sharing them with their peers, like that one scene from Sky High or that short montage from the first X-Men movie. I think this is supposed to be the Danger Room? But it lacks any of the holograms, deadly traps, and, well, personality that makes the Danger Room a memorable part of the X-Mansion. But again, it's likely that they couldn't pull off a sequence featuring more extravagant elements due to budgetary constraints, and I guess training in the manner that they do in this pilot is thematically appropriate when stacked up against Tresh's schemes. 
you know, strengthening of the mind and whatnot. It could have been cool to call this the astral plane instead of just the dream world. It'd be a nice added touch to make this feel more in line with X-Men, seeing as how so many of their stories revolve around telepaths snooping around in this dimension to get into imaginary fights or encounter ghosts or whatever. But it seems like this pilot stands firm that this is a dream world and anyone can just enter it by sleeping. This episode just makes me appreciate Legion more and more. Despite most VFX shots looking pretty cheap, I think the crew did a pretty good job with the set design in the dream world. I like the way they played around with lighting. There are some shots that are mostly just a black void with a singular beam of light and it nails that ethereal vibe that should be felt in a dimension like this. This TV pilot can be described as uneventful. For 90% of the movie, it feels like characters are just hanging around and the few plot threads this pilot has are stretched paper thin. When things finally start to ramp up, there's maybe 10 minutes of the pilot left and even then the climax is very rushed and underwhelming. However, judging Generation X as a traditional movie is unfair. Because in hindsight, I think an X-Men teen drama show focusing on the mundane and everyday struggles of adolescence could have been a strength of the show. The movies have to be more concerned with grandiose narratives and satisfying action sequences that we don't get to see the more down-to-earth moments mutants have more often. Like that one scene between Wolverine and Iceman where they're hanging out in the kitchen. Everyone loves that scene. Or the deleted mall scene from X-Men Apocalypse. I've seen so many people say, I can watch an entire X-Men movie that's just this. Well, Generation X could have given you an entire show focused on that aspect of mutant life. If it somehow got to coexist with the movies at the time, I think it would have been a great contrast. It's kind of weird that Skin's entire motivation to back Trash is that Trash keeps trying to, like, mind control a girl to f You notice that? That's like the only... It's the only reason he kind of helps him out, it's just... It's kind of a weird thing about our main character. That's not very heroic. I mean, did you forget what it's like to be a teenager already? <laughs> yeah, I, f I feel like we, f we kind of glossed over that, Diego. <laughs> so while the superhero school slice of life elements of this sound nice on paper, I wonder if that vibe was actually intentional, because watching this, these scenes come across as just filling for time or trying to develop the main two characters while the plot ramps up. Like, was this going to be the main focus the entire series had this been picked up, or was this just padding the runtime because they only had the money for one kinda half-assed fight scene? If they had the money to do more, would this show have had the restraint to be more focused on the teen drama, or would it be a more adventurous and exciting kind of thing? I honestly can't tell, so it does bring up an interesting question about the potential Generation X had. Maybe they could have done more with this premise and cast if they were given a chance. A lot of stellar TV shows had a rocky or cheap pilot episode. Some of the greatest TV shows ever had an entire first season that just kind of sucks, and that was okay back then. You gave them time to find their audience and experiment with the writing. You know, maybe this character wasn't working and needed to be replaced with someone with better chemistry with the main leads. Maybe this storyline wasn't all that interesting, so they could just drop it and find something way better for the characters to do. It seemed like TV shows had more time back then to figure things out, engage reactions to previous episodes once they put out a few of them. These days, it feels like a show gets immediately dumped in the trash if it's not a guaranteed mega hit within the first two weeks. Either it needs to break records and be the next Stranger Things, or it gets cancelled within a month or deleted from streaming forever within a year. You know, Breaking Bad didn't have great ratings for like the first three seasons. It did well enough to not get cancelled, but it wasn't this earth-shattering blockbuster until it was almost over. It had an audience, but it took its time to really get people's attention. It just seems like success stories like that kind of don't happen in television anymore. Yeah, this pilot kind of sucks, but that doesn't mean the whole show didn't deserve a shot at existing and proving itself in time. I mean, who knows how it would have grown and improved with more support. However, if it was just 52 hour long episodes exactly like this one, it would have been pretty awful. But by far the biggest tragedy of this show being so short lived is the fact that we won't get to see more of this costume. Man, this suit is so good. I wholeheartedly believe that it's one of the best on-screen superhero costumes ever made. 
It's bright, bold, and simple in its design. Too bad this pilot is also simple, but not bright or bold. I always get mad at YouTube for not putting my videos in the subscription box because people will comment, Finally, Xavier uploads again after all these years! Not knowing three other videos came out within the last month already. So maybe that stupid bell icon thing will help you remember I exist? If you want other ways to support the channel, you can always go hit up that Patreon for early videos and exclusive stuff because it's just a dollar. I'm not kidding, it's only one dollar. Isn't that cool? If just 5% of the people subscribed to me donated only one dollar a month, I could make videos even faster and keep my house. You can also check out our merch on TeePublic or just buy some of my random stuff on eBay. I have a pretty substantial collection of old toys that are still in the box in perfect condition, so go take a look in case you find something you like. And lastly, since this is a YouTube video and you probably play Fortnite, drop my creator code XavierGM next time you buy a silly dance or a cool character skin. It really helps me out. Uh, see you next time.